So God promised Abraham that through your life, through you, I will bless the world. So, our marriage. Is our marriage a blessing to each other? Now, Marcus and Naomi are going to come up and they're going to share a little bit about being on campus and working with the group. And, and what does that look like? And how are we going to have a dynamic ministry? And I think that's going to be great. But before we get into that, I want you to understand, like Ross needs to understand, is that through your <laughs> life, through your marriage, you will be a blessing to each other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've been in the church, in the ministry a long time. I've seen couples geared up, get fired up. Oh, we're going to crank. We're going to blow it out. We're going to make it happen. And maybe the husband is so overwhelming that he literally rolls over his wife to build the ministry. And 10, 20 years down the road, she's literally a beaten woman and eventually gets a divorce. I have heard yesterday. Two couples that I know that have been in the ministry for a long time, two wives are filing for divorce. Not in the church anymore, filing divorce. And both of their husbands are drivers. Focus, I'm going to build, I'm going to go after it. And you know, I'm all for building the ministry and going after it. But if you can't, be, if that blessing can't flow through you to your spouse to love, to cherish, to take care of, you're going to have a broken relationship. Right. I go back to Ephesians. Paul. And Paul says, husbands, they need what? What do husbands need? No, what do husbands need? Respect. Respect. What do the wives need? Respect. Love. They need to be loved. You need to, men need to be respected. And so if there's two things that I'm going to focus on when it comes to having a dynamic marriage, is that I'm going to make sure that my wife feels loved. And not the way I want to love her. Again, I'm not sure if we're all married in here, but you know what? There's ways that I can think that I'm going to show my wife, oh, I love you, and do things that I want to show her that I love you. But she doesn't feel love that way. She doesn't need me patting her on the behind. You know, she doesn't need me to, you know, do this or that. To, to her, that's not love. To her is maybe love is, you know, quality time. Maybe love for her is words of affirmation. Maybe love for her is, is gifts. Or whatever her love language is, you need to figure out your wife's love language. And she needs to be loved in such a way that she knows that there's nothing else in your life that's more important to you, other than your relationship with God, than her. My boys, i got two boys. My wife was before them. She's going to be around after them. And so I want to make sure our relationship is tight. So I'm going to love my wife. If I'm going to have a dynamic marriage in the ministry, my wife's got to be loved. Not beaten down. Not all these unrealistic expectations. Not her driving herself into the ground. I need to protect her and love her. And on the inverse of that... Patty's concern is, my husband needs to be respected. I might be a doofus, I might make mistakes, I might blow it, but there's at least one person that believes that I'm the man. And that's her. And that's what she does. And she's a good cook, so we get along really well. <laughs> she actually takes care of a couple needs of mine, food and respect. So when you're married, if you want to have a dynamic marriage... If you want to bless the world through this relationship, do you love your wife? Love her the way that she needs to be loved, not the way you want to love her. Oh, honey, I told you I loved you when we got married, and if I change my mind, I'll tell you again, or I'll tell you later. It doesn't work that way. What's love for your wife? Not the way you want to love her, the way she needs to be loved. And on the flip side of that, wives, do you respect your husband? Again, not the way he, you want to respect him, but the way he needs to be respected. Rolling of the eyes, shrugs, sighs, questioning. I have a long history. The way I was raised, 
Um, I love my mom, awesome woman. Um, had her own issues growing up. I, I grew up in a very disrespectful household. Right. So any sign of disrespect sets me over the edge for my wife. And she's had to learn. She grew up in a, literally a pack of engineers, dysfunctioning that way. She didn't know what love really was. We both had to work together to really understand what the other needed. So if we're going to have a dynamic marriage, I've got to literally study my spouse. What makes them tick? What gets them up in the morning? Why did they pick me over anybody else? How can I give my heart to them and engage them to the point where they feel like they're it? Patty was the only one that was willing to marry me. <laughs> so, so why do I treat her poorly? Why am I edgy? Why do I disrespect or un not love her? I'm a, I'm a fool. She loves me. And so I need to love her and give my heart to her. It's the same thing for you guys. You can't have a dynamic marriage. You can't have a dynamic relationship in the ministry. It's hard. But you know what? It's hard out of the ministry. I've been in the ministry and out of the ministry. Got fired, got back in the ministry. Now we leave the Dallas Church. Thousand members plus. I found out a long time ago, being in the ministry is emotionally hard. Being out of the ministry is physically hard. It's going to be hard. <laughs> so you just got to pick what kind of hard do you want. You want to be emotionally drained or physically drained. But it's going to be draining. So don't think being in the ministry or out of the ministry is easier or harder. They're both hard. So you have a responsibility to bless your spouse. Through that relationship, you will bless those around you. So Marcus and Naomi are going to come up, and they're going to share some really some good scriptures, but it's also some practicals about what does that look like with two young kids and being in the full-time ministry. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, God. Guys, I, I got to tell you something. I want to have this opportunity to share with you guys uh, about us, about our marriage, about what's going on with us. And uh, just talking about having a, a dynamic marriage is really great. Uh, a little bit about us. Uh, we are both from Washington. Well, Somewhat from Washington State, we got our training in Washington State. Uh, Nomi's from Hawaii, land of paradise. But, uh, but no, uh, I became a disciple as a teen, and she got baptized at a, a campus retreat that we were both at when we were freshmen back in uh, 2002. And so it's kind of funny, you know, imagine going to a campus retreat, and then the very person you saw get baptized, you married them, you know, five years later. That's kind of our story there, and uh, we kind of went in separate paths, we were in different campus ministries. Uh, but ended up uh, falling in love when I became the intern at her campus ministry during her last year of college. So that was great. We led the ministry together uh, there in Tacoma, Washington uh, within a couple years. Uh, we had two sons. Well, we have twin boys. And uh, so I'll show you guys some pictures if you come up afterwards. It, they are the coolest sons ever. Uh, I mean, literally. I, I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry. Sorry to tell you, but I know, right behind you know, Grand Blake. But uh, I mean, it, it's, it's really funny. We actually found out we had twins on April 1st. And so, after, uh, so we literally go to the doctor, and you know, ultrasound. And, you know, for those who have kids, you guys are with me. You're just freaked out that you're having a kid. <laughs> and you're there, yeah. and then the ladies, you know, she's like, oh my gosh, we have twins, you know. And we're like, oh, April Fool's, ha, 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 you know. <laughs> you almost got us, you know. And then she said, no, actually, oh, it is April 1st, isn't it? She's like, but no, but look at these two heartbeats. And literally, you're in the, you know, you're in the doctor's place, you're like, ha, 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 ha. You know, like, you laugh, but you're scared to death. <laughs> Because you're like, I'm in the ministry, I don't got any money. <laughs> I can barely have a kid. We had a fun night, you know, nine months ago. Having a kid, but now we're having two. Like, it was pretty intense. So, a lot of fun there. And then uh, then we got appointed as an evangelist, a woman's ministry leader, the next year. Uh, but we always had a dream to work with just college students. And uh, so that's what brought us to Texas two years later. 
Uh, so we've been here uh, in Texas for two years. It's been great. Uh, Texas is amazing. That's right. No place like it. The sods are great. Uh, the hoopers are great. Uh, there in Austin, it's it's a lot of fun. I know. I know. Everybody. <laughs> it's so great. So uh, we're really excited to get a chance to share. I think uh, basically what I'm going to do re- really quickly is just go through some points and practicals of what we've learned. Uh, you know, being married and, and having kids. I think number one, uh, and, and, and again, a lot of these points you, you, you're going to, you know. You would have heard before at a, at a marriage class or whatever, but but I really want you to, again, have it in your heart, thinking about it as if it's the first time you've heard it. Okay. Because sometimes, uh, if you're with me, sometimes you need to hear something three or four times to really get it. Right? So number one, God must come first. And it's interesting, even as I, uh, you know, we're talking about the class with the Assads, and it's funny, uh, a couple more points I'll talk about in a moment, but my first point wasn't God first. And it was really great talking to Todd, and you know, and it, it was language, but Todd's like, yeah, actually, God does come first. And he wasn't necessarily telling me to, to change the lesson up, but it was interesting how he even spoke, and it reminded me that, man, how, how, you know, how important this really is in your marriage. How important is this really in your family? Because sometimes as a campus minister, you could be telling the students to do all this stuff, but you can forget to do it yourself. That's right. And so you really have to stop and say, man, is God first in my life? And something that's so important, something that we've learned. That again, you know, I think the point is that if you can't, if you're not close to God, there's no way you can be close to your spouse or your kids. I mean, literally, I can say for us, you know, we've married seven years, uh, you know, and we've made mistakes and have, you know, bumps and, and all these other things. But one thing that's kept us connected is God. And it's got to be the same way with you guys. God has got to come first. It's the relationship that's going to really allow you to be strong through the storms of life. And and again, the older you get, the more storms happen in your marriage or family and your family. And, you know, for us now, uh, you know, grandfathers and people are getting older. Uh, People, you know, some people have passed on. My my great grandmother died um, right before we got married. And so, you know, we were there. So, so again, the longer you're together, the more these things are going to happen. But you need to have a relationship with God. Nothing can replace that. I think a practical uh, is that you got to get away with God every day. And I really want to encourage you, especially if you have kids, don't let that be an excuse. You've got to get away with God, and however you do it, uh, I know for me, there's a park right down the street of my house, and I just love when I'm on my way to the park, because I know that I'm going to have my time with God. And I just have it out with God. And I I just talk about, man, what's going on in the ministry? Man, I'm, I'm worried about this. Man, this situation happened. But I need that. Because God yeah. comes first. Yeah, yeah. I need it so bad, you know, in, in my life, and it's yeah. just so important, you know, in that way. You know, I think another thing is, is you know, you really have to, uh, you know, pray, pray all the time. You know, um, there's actually a great book called Prayer by Ian Bounds, and it's really great because he talks about how uh, really the early Christian patriarchs of the past. I mean, these guys prayed for hours a day. Right. Ian Bounds talks about he would he would wake up about seven and get done praying about one in the afternoon, and that was just commonplace for for John Wesley and Ian Bounds and these guys. It wasn't even a big thing, and yet that's the way you really got to need to be in your life in terms of prayer. You got to be someone who prays. Definitely practical. You got to have on your heart. You got to stay inspired. I, I think even with God. Uh, I think something I've decided, uh, even in our staff, is as we talk, and I really want to encourage you to do this, whatever someone's read that you haven't, you make sure you go and read it as well. Yeah. You know, people are talking about Diedrich Bonhoeffer and, you know, Ian Bounds. I, I remember sometimes in staff, I'm like, huh? Who's Diedrich? Who? You know, I, I don't know even know who these guys are talking about, but I need to know. I need to stay inspired. you got to stay inspired to have a dynamic marriage. you got to stay inspired yourself as a disciple yeah. in that way. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Naomi actually share a little bit about uh, staying inspired, yeah. putting yeah. God first. Well, I think about putting God first, right? And as a wife, you're just so caught up in trying to learn how to be one with your husband. Um, you're learning how to cook. Or, uh, this is probably just me. Well, I didn't know how to cook before. I remember when we were engaged. I hear you. We were like, so what do you know how to cook? And I'm like, I know how to cook rice chicken, and I know how to heat up corn. That's pretty much my meal in campus. Because, you know, that's like a... That's a kind of luxury meal in campus, you know, because we're all men and mac and cheese. And so, and he's like, yeah, I know how to boil water. And I'm like, oh, Boils okay. Water. So, That's right. Yeah, that was it. You know, so you're just learning all these things as a newlywed. And then you have kids. Like, I remember having babies. And I was just like, how do I put God first, right? And I think it's easy when you're 
just married, still without kids, it's easy to get away still, right? Like you're able to put that in your schedule. But man, with kids, like I just remember um, great advice from other people, like listening to the Bible, you know, like, mm, yeah. um, and then now with my toddlers, like I just have to train them. Hey, mommy needs to read your Bible, yeah. so you read your Bible, I read my Bible, we're both happy, then we get to That's right. Books, That's like, right. We're going to pray together, and they know it's a routine. Every time I come downstairs, mm-hmm. they're like, Mommy, you going to work out? I'm like, nope, I'm going to read my Bible, so you read your Bible too. And they it's know. great, you know, like, but just that training. But I think it's just getting creative. I think for yes. a woman, like you're carrying around so many hats, you know, like being a wife and a mom and ministry leader, it's just a friend, mentor, I mean, so many things, right? So I think just getting creative really helps Absolutely. in our marriage. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So God first. Number two, you've got to prioritize your marriage. Prioritize your marriage. And I think, again, just learning that you're not single anymore. And you really have to value the new chapter of your life being married. And not present it. And really, and really just know that this is God's uh, mindset and His vision for you. And for you to really embrace this new role of being married and especially having kids. It's awesome. But you really have to prioritize your marriage and really, uh, really give your heart to it. You know, I think, if, again, um, even being in Texas has been so good for me. Uh, I remember I used to go to all these conferences and ICNICs and, and different things like that. And I'd always pull people aside and be like, all right, brother, you know, sister, tell me, how much, how much do I give in my personal time with my wife? How much time in the ministry? You know, like, I'm, I'm looking for a formula, right? Yeah, right. Every, every conference. You're probably might be, maybe here. Hoping I'll give you one, right? <laughs> and it was just so cool being around the, the ministers in Texas because they said, you know what? We don't even think about it like that. There, there is no balancing your family or balancing the ministry. It's that your life is the ministry. Everything you do is the ministry. Your family is the ministry. They're one. And it was just funny. I heard it, but, but, but it, didn't, it didn't sink in for a while. And then I realized, you know what? My family matters so much. Another great advice a campus minister, a friend of mine, he said, you know what? This is the thing, man. He's like, if you won't prioritize your marriage and your family, what a mistake you're going to make. Because, and, and, and again, this is starting to happen to me. I'm sure this happened to some of us here. That people would have been baptized. You baptized. But you don't even remember their name. You don't even remember who they are. But what do you remember? Your kids and your wife. It's the only thing that's going to still be remain, you know, remain, right? And I think that's the thing you got to be thinking about. Like, what's really going to matter? What's going to be going to matter? You know, when it's all said and done, even campus ministry, you'll probably do it for a while. I don't know how long, but but you don't want to be at the end of your ministry time knowing you invested so much in the ministry and not in your family. Right. So you got to prioritize your marriage is so so important. Uh, you know, in, you know, in that in that way. You know, I think again in terms of practicals. Uh, we talk about our schedule, and, you know, talk about our time together every week. And so, again, don't miss that time to really discuss your schedule. Uh, we have family dinners every night. Again, that was uh, really preached years and years ago, and Amen. it really stuck. And, and let it stick with your family, because yeah. even if you don't have kids yet, you, you know, they're really going to go on the habits that you've already built. Okay? So, so again, that was just so important for us. It was invaluable. Have family dinners every night. Uh, Weekly devos with our kids. I love my son, Caleb. Uh, one of my sons, Caleb and Isaac. It, we're to the point now where I'm like, Caleb, what did Moses say? He's like, let my people go. <laughs> and, and, and we go through all the Bible stories. And right now, it's just remembering like little things. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, all right, what did Joseph do? He's like, forgave his brothers. <laughs> you know, and, and it's awesome because we put that time in. And we prioritize um, our family and how important that is. A couple other practicals. Again, having healthy boundaries uh, with the students. Um, again, sometimes uh, <clears throat> sometimes you need to say, you know what? I'm not going to be able to make it there tonight. Yep. And now, now, again, you don't want to make that the habit, the habit, right? Where you're always, you know, not being there with the students or you're always canceling. Because then they're going to be like, man, you, you're actually not investing your heart. That's not good either, right? Yeah. But at the same time, hey, prioritize your family. You're going to say, you know what? I can't make it tonight, <clears throat> but I'll be there tomorrow. And that's okay. You know, in terms of your, your priorities, make sure that that's very, very important. You know, in, a, in terms of, um, again, dates. Dates have been a trip for us, too, because, again, having two little ones, uh, some people are like, man, you need to go on a date every week. And, hey, man, you know, if that can work for you, awesome. Uh, we, didn't, we found that that was just a little too much. Uh, just, just more not wanting to be together, but having to find a babysitter every week was pretty intense. So what we do is we say, all right. You know, we kind of look at look at each other and say, yeah, it's time for a date. You know, and then we'll ask, 
Um, but but we really talk about those things. Um, something that's really been great for us lately is just having a getaway. So just just a night away. Uh, we even have a student living with us now, so it's a little bit easier. But yeah, just make sure you say, all right, every couple weeks, let's just get away. Every couple of weeks, let's go to a movie. You know, whatever you guys like to do for home, whatever brought you guys together to begin with, go back to that. Yeah. Don't forget your, you know, in that way, your first love and your relationship uh, in that way is it, really being together in terms of your relationship. I'm trying to think of anything else. Uh, and, and of course, you got to meet each other's needs. I appreciate what Todd said. Emotionally, physically, uh, and sexually, you have some great books, Sacred Marriage, His Needs, Her Needs. Again, your marriage has got to be about uh, not just what pleases you, but everything about your marriage is about what pleases your spouse. Uh, sacred marriage is so great because it talks about marriage is not about your happiness. So, I think, again, our world has it so skewed where everything about marriage is for you to be happy. Exactly. But it's actually, no, no, it's, it's actually set up for you to be godly and holy. Right. Yeah. So, again, you, you have to change your paradigm in the way that you uh, think about marriage. Nobody's going to share about prioritizing marriage. Well, I appreciate Marcus's leadership in our family because. Okay, so just laying out all my craziness. Um, but I'm a very selfish and stubborn woman and really highly opinionated. And so when Mark is when we first got married, he's like, okay, so we're going to do family dinners every night. And I'm like, really? Like, I work with you. I wake up next to you. I, I see you all the time. Like, I'm really tired of you. For dinners, you know, like, and I'm like, but I got things to do, you know, and uh, whatever. And then, but I just feel like it's kind of like if any of you guys have, um, had the privilege of hearing Barry Lust yesterday, right, about how knowing your limits, love for your husband is spelled R-E-S-P-C-T, right? And so, um, but really, because of his leadership, it's helped us have those habits of having a strong, solid foundation for our kids, you know, like, hey, now it's easier for me. Like, it's now, like, it's such a habit after seven years, you know, of just being like, okay, family dinner at six. Like, that means I need to get home by five so I can cook or even earlier if I need to clean the house like Mars has um, some expectations you know like when he walks in he wants to have a clean home as we all should you know and and so like I just think sometimes prioritizing those things like just having those healthy boundaries and I think because I have kids like it is so good to tell your students what your boundaries are. Um, I, you know, I, I try to get involved with every Bible study. Sometimes it can be a lot on some weeks. Uh, some is like really um, slim. But I tell my students, I cannot be there if it's at 5 p.m. Like, I need time to drive home. Um, I need to cook dinner. And so I can, I'm not available between 5 and 7. You know, and sometimes they'll still call me, hey, Nomi, you need to be there. It's at 5. And I'm like, I told you a week ago I cannot be there at 5. You know, and so just... You know, it will sound repetitive and maybe slightly nagging, but the students need to know your own boundaries so they have a great example yeah. you know, when they get married and knowing those kind of things. So. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Number three, work extremely hard. you got to work hard. And I, I think in many ways, uh, what I'd say about this is uh, you got to remember that being in the ministry, it, it is a job. It is something that you need to work at. And in fact, to have a dynamic marriage, you got to work harder than you did at, you know, than you did when you were a single or a college student. And, and again, it's going to be even, it's going to require a lot more from you even when you have children. But you've got to work hard, uh, especially depending on the season of the campus ministry. Yeah. You know, for us, the beginning, you've got to understand, okay, the fall time, you know, it, it's going to require hours and hours and hours on campus. Uh, and and you got to realize that, man, uh, this is going to be important for us, uh, you know, for our marriage, but also for their ministry to work extremely hard. You know, I think what does that mean? Uh, you know, for us is we both have to be visible on campus. And I really want to encourage, you know, wherever situation you're at, make sure the students see both the man and the woman on campus sharing their faith. I think for years, sometimes it's just been the guy and, and that type of thing, but but, but that, that makes an impact on the students. They, 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 again, the guy might be more and, and that kind of the way it works for us, but, but man, it's gotta be both of you guys. Together, we've got to be visible. We've got to work hard uh, in that way. Again, husbands, make sure your wife has at least one day on campus. We, we set up our schedule Wednesdays. Naomi has that morning block. She could just be away. And, and, and sometimes, Naomi's awesome. Uh, she gets on campus with the kids and gets past the fear and, and some of the trepidation sometimes people have. But, but she also has a day where she just knows she's on campus and she's doing what a woman's ministry leader does. And she's not worried about Isaac and Caleb tugging on her and mommy got to go to pee pee. You know, yeah, she's not, <laughs> she don't worry about that. And so you have to free your wife from that, yeah. you know, in that way. Husbands, make sure you do that. 
Again, fill up your schedule. Um, again, work together. Uh, family dinners have been great for us. Sometimes I'll bring a guy over, and they'll be like, oh, what, was up? "What was up with that?" What you saying about his dad? And stuff that I don't even I didn't even see in this guy, yeah. but your wife is going to see, or your husband's going to see. Hey, you know that was weird the way she said that. And again, you guys are a team. You got to work together. Uh, you got to work hard. And I think also uh, you got to have a plan when you're on campus. Again, turn your phone off. Have a plan. I know for me, I write down, okay, hey, that brother wasn't looking that good at Evo last Friday. I'm going to make sure I set up some time with him. Mm-hmm. Or, hey, I need to go share. Or, hey, I need to confirm the Devo location. When you, whenever, you know, your, your, your time is crunched. So, whenever you're on campus, it's so important for you to go forward. Yeah. Nobody's going to share about campus and kids. Okay, so, having twins, really difficult. I love my kids. They're the cutest ever. Um, probably really biased. Um, but... It is really hard having them on campus. And I remember, you know, like in Washington, honestly, taking the kids with me was really just a grasp I can be sane. You know, because I was, um, I don't know if anyone else struggled with this, but I was really mad at Marcus that he could leave whenever he wanted. (laughs) I was like, you know, I was just like, split. (laughs) You know, that didn't work out. You know, he he said they need to be best friends. I'm like, they're three months old. But, you know, but. You know, like, or I was, like, struggling. I don't know if any other women struggle with this. Or I was like, why am I the only feeding source, you know? So, <laughs> have a plan. Get advice. Honestly, like, I know for me, talk to other people about um, babysitting schedule, hiring a student, you know, talk yeah. to, um, have to get my kids on a plan. And so just be creative again, like, but just yeah. get a lot of advice. Like, honestly, it's not like I came up with it on my own. And so I just had a lot of people in there with me. Come on, man. Amen. Thank you, Naomi. All right, the next week we're actually going to fly, but I'm, I'm going to go over Number four, you have to have a Sabbath day. you got to take some time off. Again, you got to work hard. And this is something that we never really did in the ministry, but it's so, so important. Uh, the Wilkinsons, Marty and Deanna, thank you guys so much, you know, for, for them really helping us out with this. Uh, you just need some time away, not to just lounge necessarily, but to focus on God. Yep. It's interesting, in the Old Testament, keeping the Sabbath was so important. Why don't we do it now? Right. You've got to do it now. Yeah. To be godly, just to focus on God, and, and just not be working all the time. Because you're going to get thinking that your work is the reason why all this happens, instead of God. Right. You need time just away, just think about God, think about your family, think about the ways that He's blessed you. Uh, so you've got to take a day off again. Uh, not answering, you know, you know, this situation or this brother, that, that. You, you, you need some time away. Right. For us, we don't have a, a complete day, but, hey, we know Monday until dinner time, we have time. Right. Away, okay? And, again, that allows us to have recreation, companionship, and also intimacy. Amen, brothers, amen, right? Amen, amen, you need that day off, all right? All right, number five. You've got to raise up leaders to do the work of the ministry. Amen. you got to raise them up. Um, Again, your, your goal as a campus minister is to train people to train. Okay, you're training people to train up the people in your campus ministry. And I think, again, in many ways, uh, you, you, you have to observe them. You have to observe. You have to be involved. You have to say what needs to be said as it relates uh, to their life. Say what needs to be said. That's right. And then, and then lastly, and then lastly, you need to have grace. Uh, you got to have grace for one another. Grace. You guys are going to, amen, right? you got to have grace. <laughs> because you, you guys are going to make the mistakes, you're going to hurt one another, and you guys got to work Come together. Come on, man. So, amen. Hey, 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 amen. 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 Well, I don't know about you guys. All of these things have been hard for me over the years. None of this comes naturally. And I wanted to let you guys know, even though I don't know most of you, I've been thinking about you for weeks. Because I look back on when I was a young married or had small children working in the campus ministry. That was by far the hardest time for me. And it wasn't just circumstantial. It's just when we got married, I probably had more issues than National Geographic. And I had a lot to work through. And I think about this quote. I was glad uh, Marcus mentioned this book, Sacred Marriage. I think it's one of the best marriage books I have ever read. Probably the best. And these two researchers, they came up with this, this idea. They go, they've never observed a generally constant collaborative union between spouses during the period when they are raising children. What that means is it's really hard and you're not going to get it totally figured out. (laughs) And I just want to share about some things I've had to learn the hard way. And one of the 
biggest things for me is just remembering all the time God is watching me. Don't turn there for the sake of time. I'm going to read Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You're in the weary years. You know, when you're working campus ministry, you're there 12 hours a day, if not more. You know, you're coming home exhausted. You're trying to have dinner together. You're trying to get it all figured out because you haven't been married that long. Or maybe you have small children. And what has helped me more than anything is just remembering the example of Christ and knowing that God sees me. And that God's way always works and I need to trust him. Because there have been so many times over the years I have not felt like doing what was right. But fortunately, because of great discipling and, and having a Bible, I knew what God wanted me to do, though, even though I didn't want to do it. And I think about an example. This is like a snapshot in our lives. And this was probably about, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. And we had gone to a conference and all this. And there was something that was it really came to my mind when we were at this conference. I just really felt like Todd needed to change it. And so I really prayed about it. And, you know, because I prayed about it, of course, I was bringing up the very words of Christ. So I went to Papa And we sit down. And all of a sudden, I mean, it's just, I'm telling him what I think, and it is going south. And I think, mean, what did I do? I prayed about this. This is so important. It could have been that important because I don't remember what it was now. It was something I thought he needed to change. And I just was really... You know, and I realized during the conversation that I was starting to speak disrespectfully and in an unloving tone. And I'm thinking, you know, you should apologize. And then I'm thinking, it was almost like I had a demon on one side, I think, on the other, you know, shoulder. And no, then he's going to blow off everything I just said. He's not going to listen, and Todd needs to get this. Mm -hmm. And I have a friend that used to uh, love to say, you can never be too humble. In that moment, I felt like I could. (laughs) <laughs> and finally, you know, the spirit run out, and I knew, oh, I realize God's in control here. His way always works, and I need to just give this to God and let God deal with it. Yeah. And so finally, you know, I, I, I stopped myself. I'm like, honey, I am so sorry. During the course of this conversation, I've been disrespectful and unloving. Please forgive me. And um, Todd starts to laugh, and I'm thinking, Oh, great. He's blowing it off. Oh, well. And I go, why are you laughing? And he goes, because I'm so convicted. And it all got worked out immediately. Now, is it always going to be like that? You, know, you get on all your spouse just miraculously humbles out to you. That God's way always works. So I think of another time. This was probably about 10 years ago. And uh, we were going through a, a hard time. Uh, the Dallas Church was going through some stuff. And I had to take the women off staff. I was uh, working another job. And Todd was still trying to do the ministry. I was trying to do what I could with the ministry. Todd was working on his master's in Bible. Todd was director of the camp. Um, I have a chronic illness. I was also very sick. And we were leading a like I said, a large ministry, but I wasn't really in the ministry, and we had teenage children at home. And so we just had a lot. And like Todd mentioned, my love language is quality time, like off the scales. And I felt, and you can forget my birthday, but look in the eyes and talk to me for a while, I'll be okay. And uh, he, uh, I was just feeling like, this was just my emotions talking, because I just felt like we weren't getting good quality time. And I felt like Todd could not be nice to save his life. And we'd talk about it. And it had been a year. We'd been close to long. You get to a point in your marriage where you kind of have each other a little more figured out. It's a little easier. Well, we had been stuck like this in years. We'd get with another couple, kind of talk about, kind of put a band-aid on it, and it just wouldn't get any better. And I didn't know what was wrong. I just wasn't happy. I wasn't feeling real love. And then finally, I mean, if another, I was looking at it in my heart like it was to 
all Todd's fault. And if another sister had said that to me, I've known for years that I takes two to tango. I mean, it's never, ever all one-sided. But I sure felt like that. I mean, when it's my emotions in the middle of it, it's hard to see clearly. And finally, as I patty aside, you have not exactly been Susie Sunshine. You know, and I love, I love Todd. And I thought, even if Todd never, ever, ever changes another thing, I just need to be happy and love him. God sees me, and he sees how I've been, too. So I repented. Within two days, everything was wonderful again. Now, does it really mean it was just me the whole time, or God worked a miracle? I don't know. <laughs> but what I do know is no matter what is going on, what we feel, what our circumstances are, what, what our emotions are saying, God's way always works, and we need to trust that. So, with that being said, uh, I appreciate all the input that was given. you got to take the long view. You guys are in this for the rest of your life. Okay? There's no shortcuts. There's, no, there's nothing you can do that it's all right. You have to... You have to put the time in. If you want to have a dynamic marriage, if you want to bless all nations, if you want to make a great impact on your campus ministry or with the students you're working with, with your children, you got to take the long view. you got to have the convictions and understand. It's like, I'm going to have to put the time in every day. One thing I'll leave you with, I cannot, we cannot overemphasize having someone in your life that you can talk to, walk with, discuss. They might not be able to be on campus with you. They might not be able to disciple you know, you with your kids, but you've got to have someone. They don't have to be in the ministry, but someone who you respect their marriage, that you can go to and you can talk to, that, that you can be open, that you can throw yourself under the bus and not feel like you're kind of going to get beat up or someone's going to jump you, but really being open and vulnerable. That has helped all the couples that we've seen when they have people in their lives, uh, they get that help. Um, it's someone who will listen to both sides uh, of the situation and, and work out for the glory of God. So hopefully uh, the stuff that you shared today uh, is going to be able to help you in your relationship. Uh, help you in your marriage, help you build the kind of ministry that God is wanting to build through you. Let's say a word of prayer, then we're dismissed. You have about ten minutes to go to the next set of classes. So let's pray. Our uh, Father God, we uh, thank you uh, for this time we had together. God, we're grateful. God, we pray for the, uh, the rest of the classes, uh, that they uh, go well, that we learn. God, we're grateful for the opportunity to be here uh, to really see you work through the campus ministries. Uh, we love you. Thank you for the spouse you bless us with. Amen. It's in your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.